Welcome to Nurturing Our Roots, The Journey from Slavery to Freedom, live Zoom sessions with Antoinette and Karen. We're live every Tuesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time to talk show where ordinary people with extraordinary family stories can be heard. If you have a family story and would like to share with us, we would gladly like to hear your family story. Please contact us at nurturingourroots at gmail.com. I'm Antoinette, and here's my co-host and my cousin, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, Antoinette. How are you? I am doing good this afternoon. Um, you know, as always, I'm going to allow you to go ahead and introduce our guests. It, well, guests and almost like family because we are family of genealogy. <laughs> so here it is, Karen. While I go and get everything set up for us, it's in your hand. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. Oh, uh, Welcome. Uh, tonight, we're going to have uh, Bernice Bennett, who's going to talk to us tonight about uh, homesteading. And uh, welcome, Bernice. Thank you, Karen. Thank and you. And I understand. <laughs> I understand that you have some guests with you. You want to go on and introduce who you have with you, Bernice? That's right. Uh, Janice Woods is my sister, and Denise Gritz is a homesteader descendant. <laughs> and so you're going to tell us what this homesteading is all about. That's so. right. Homesteading 101. What 101. do we need to know? Okay, so uh, shall I share my screen? If you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. So everyone, uh, the, the title of this discussion is Searching for Descendants of African American Homesteaders. And these would be individuals that acquired land under the Homestead Act of 1862. Now, when I talk about homesteading, we are looking at a project also to identify those individuals to be a part of the Black Homesteading in America project. This project is part of the Homestead National Historical Park. It's located in Nebraska. And the goal is to find individuals who have family members that acquired land under the Homestead Act. Now, everyone knows who this is. This is President Abraham Lincoln. Well, President Abraham Lincoln signed the act in May of 1862 hence the Homestead Act of 1862. And it went into effect January 1st, 1863. Now just think about this folks, we're talking about public land that people could get up to 160 acres of public land. But there's certain criteria. They could never take up arms against the United States. Former slaves and women could file. They had to show improvements and they had to be over the age of 21. And there's a three part process. First, they had to file an application, then improve the land and then go back with evidence that they did improve the land with witnesses and with that, they would be given a land patent. So just look at this map for a minute. Everything that you see in brown, that's where all of the public land is located. So can you imagine how many descendants 
are probably out there and don't even know it. But this is what we're going to talk about today. So I mentioned after they've gone through this process, they will be given a patent, which means that you're transferring land from the government to an individual. And this is what the original patent looked like for my ancestor, Peter Clark. This is original, a copy of the original, which is in the hands of a relative right now. And this is my great, great grandfather, Peter Clark. He's sitting and standing next to him is his son, Moses. So now you have an image of who I will be talking about. Well, as I said to you earlier, that patent really is the end of the process, but I'm going to take you to the beginning of the process. And for Peter Clark, this is what his land entry papers look like. And I'm going to share several of those papers. He applied for this land April 25th, 1887. And he had to put down an $18 filing fee. They're not buying the land, but they do have to pay to file applications and additional information. Now on his application is stated, I am a native citizen of the United States over the age of 21 years and head of a family. So you'll see this in the application. There are also questions that the applicant is expected to respond to. So as you can see, question number one, what is your name, Peter Clark? 38 years old, Marpa, Louisiana. He was born in Louisiana. Then there's a question about when was your house built? My house was built and I established actual residence on the land over 10 years ago. Isn't that amazing? When you start reading, the stories just start coming right out of the applications. Of whom, you know, they wanna know who are you living with? of my wife and four children. We have lived on there continuously since first establishing residence. And then there are other questions. They wanna know the character of the land, Piney Woods land, most valuable for farming when clear. And he cleared about five acres for 10 years. Now just think about an acre. I think an acre may be the size of a football field and he cleared five acres, that's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. But there's another part to this process. He had to go back to the land office and this time with witnesses. These witnesses would attest to the fact that Peter Clark did comply with the guidelines that he lived on the land and he cleared the land. And these are the individuals that are listed in his homestead application. I followed up. I wanted to know who some of these witnesses were. And I can tell you, Marshall Douglas was a former member of the United States Colored Troops. Charles Baptiste, oh, I found that he was a witness to my grandmother's mm. wedding in 1913. Henry Tinkshell, mm lived down the street from my great, great, great grandfather, Thomas Youngblood. And Robert Benefil was the editor of the newspaper. So when you start going through these files, there's something you need to start asking yourself. Who are these people? Who are the witnesses? Who are the witnesses? Right. And this information is also placed in the newspaper for about six weeks so that everyone is aware of the fact that this homestead, or at least he has put in a homestead entry file for this land and it's in the newspaper. So everyone's aware of it. Now you may find different things in a file, but I found this narrative, which, which at one point I was really sad, then I got very happy but he almost did not make it because he didn't have the money to pay the cost to go back to New Orleans. So you have to go 
to a land office and the land office was located in New Orleans and he didn't have the money. So when he finally got the money, he said, you know, he's a very poor person. And until today, he has not been able to get the money to pay the cost of making proof. And this is the earliest day he had the money that he has lived on the established land in good faith for over 10 years. And it would work a great hardship were he deprived of his entry. Wherefore, he prays that his proof be accepted past his final certificate receipt issue thereon and bottom line, Peter Clark did get his land, his 159.33 acres of land in 1896. And this is what you might find in Ancestry.com. If you're looking for land, you may find a patent that looks like this document right here. But the question that some of you may have is, well, how do I find my ancestors? Well, I already told you it was the states that were all brown. So if you're in Arkansas, if you're in Florida, Alabama, go in, put your ancestors name in. If you know where they live, this is the Bureau of Land Management patent site. And I did that for Peter Clark. So here's Peter Clark's name. He was in Livingston Parish and his name came up as a homesteader. So you'll find that information that your ancestor is a homesteader if indeed they have information on the Bureau of Land Management site. But I then question, you know, could some of those men that were witnesses for Peter Clark also be African American? Well, yes, they are. Charles Baptiste, Alfred Robinson, and Henry Tinkshell were all African-American homesteaders, which I was just jumping up and down with joy to find that. And they served as witnesses for Peter Clark. And this is just an entry, a track entry, where once that land is recorded, you will be able to find that land recorded in the track books on the Bureau of Land Management site. So it's just a legacy that you wanna really talk about. Now I'm sharing this book and this award because I want you all to know that my story of finding Peter Clark's land is in this book, Tracing Their Steps, a memoir. And I was just so excited to find out that my book won the first place winner of the African-American Nonfiction Book Award with the Next Generation Indie Book Awards. And the ceremony is on June 25th. So I hope that you all will tune in and watch the Book Awards ceremony. But let's go back to the Black Homesteading in America uh, site again. The reason I'm really talking about this project is because it has been around. The focus has been on the plains, the Great Plains. Those of you that have ancestors in Colorado and Montana and New Mexico and Nebraska, North Dakota and South Dakota and Wyoming and soon Oklahoma, they've been gathering stories about the black homesteaders in those regions. But what I'm really trying to encourage people to also look for black homesteaders in other regions. And so this is a list of descendant stories that have been written. And right now those stories are on the Homestead National Historical Park Service website. This is what we're doing. We're gathering our information and then the descendants are writing their stories. So Angela Walton Raji has written her story about her ancestor, Louis Mitchell Bass in Arkansas. As you can see, look at this Louisiana. We have four people, at least five people that have written stories for Louisiana and more are on the way. Michigan, Dr. Shelley Viola Murphy. I mean, she is our superstar. She has four stories. 
And then Denise Griggs, of which you will hear from Denise shortly, she has two stories. And Sandra Williams Bush, Samuel Brown is here, and Margo Lee Williams, Randall Farnell from Florida. So, folks, we have stories coming from everywhere. But, Denise, I'm going to turn it over to you so that you could share information about your ancestor, and then I'll come back on and finish up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Um, also, I want to thank you for at least notifying me about this and how excited I was to be involved along with you. You're just my little hero for helping me at, out at the National Archives about 10 years ago. So thank you very much. Um, with my uh, ancestors, I have a total of five. Two are uploaded now and I have three more to upload shortly. And um, the first one was Peter Hunt and his mother who um, filed uh, a claim for a homestead. I also have um, Prince Dunbar, Willis Hunt, and William Layton Hammond. But with uh, Peter and his mother, their properties, of course, were pretty close to one another. And he originally filed for his in, I believe it was like 1863, no, 1864, um, not sure right here. But he was, um, after they were emancipated, he uh, enlisted in the United States Color Troops and his father was his slave owner. And so uh, Peter did learn to read and write. And uh, even though he was born in a Mitt County, his half brother came in, um, shared on his pension, the date of his birth, August 5th, 1844. And so, um, let's see. He's also listed on the African-American Civil War uh, Museum, but he applied for like 157 acres, a little over 157 acres and he proved he is within that five year period. And um, the, thankfully, the property is still in the family. They don't kind of like talk about it. But a good portion of it is still in the family. And then his mother in 1883, she filed for a little over 39 acres. And um, it was about 1892 before she received her patent. But I was just so impressed with America that we're about the same age. I'm like a year older than what she is now. And she really had a hard life. And um, she was 70 years old when she applied for that patent. Not when she applied, but when she got her land grant. And she lived in a house that was like 16 by 16. And it was like, oh, my God, how small is that? <laughs> but she was proud of that fact. She had a couple of horses, a couple of cows, pigs. And, you know, she was uh, she did improve her land. And um, unfortunately, though, in 1883, her one of her daughters died. So instead of her raising the three children, Peter raised them. <laughs> and. One thing about it, I started looking at the um, uh, witnesses. And when I looked in particular um, at Prince Dunbar, his witnesses were Josh Starks, Lim Wade, and Howard Weeks. And I just about fell out of the chair because all these are relatives. Mm -hmm. And it just further let me recognize the community that they all lived in. And America had a daughter named Harriet, and she had most of America's daughters married these men, which was just astounding. And if it wasn't her daughters, it was her granddaughters who married these witnesses. And um, I was also amazed, and you might be amazed too, that all the witnesses aren't black. Two Confederate, former Confederate soldiers, 
came in and vouched as witnesses for like a Willis hunt, there's gotta be some kind of relationship there because they were all from the uh, Hunt plantation. And Henry Hunt and this Bunyan Dunn guy, Bunyan was married to Henry Hunt's daughter. But those two came to be witnesses for Willis Hunt, a black man. He's probably mulatto like Peter was, but somehow or another, I think they could have been half brothers there too. So that just really excited me all the more. And once you begin to look into that history, you'll just start saying, hey, wait a minute, I know that name. I recognize that name. Or why was this black woman living in their house? Why were they taking care of her? Why did they come forward? You know, so now I'm just off in another magnificent direction <laughs> of research. So uh, you'll be surprised and you'll feel so honored that your relatives weren't just slaves being run over like we were taught. Never did anything, didn't vote, didn't go to school. I was taught that right here in California, in high school, no less. And I just refused to believe it. And so now that I know, after like 30 years of research, now that I know, I'm just bursting with pride, just pride that they could come from a situation so bad and within 20 years, make something of themselves and pass down the property to their family, support themselves. It's just, it's fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. So as a curriculum person, I will be writing that up, you know, for our youngsters to know. And so they can succeed too. And so, and, and, you know, that's kind of the, the excitement. I, I rejoice every time somebody will send me a note and say, I have a land patent because I'm, I'm celebrating with them. Right. They will now have a land entry file to learn a little bit more about their ancestors. I see Sandra and Fallon, do either of you want to say something? Hi, Bernice. Uh, I, um, don't know a lot about my great grandfather, Samuel Brown, but when I found him in the census in 1900, it indicated that he was a farmer and that he owned um, his farm mm -hmm. outright. It wasn't a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And when I told my mother about this, she didn't know anything about it. And she was amazed. And um, she asked me, well, well, how could that be? Because he was born in 1864, you know, and, you know, she wanted to know more about it. And that's how I got into genealogy anyway, because of my mother. Well, I found his um, certificate in the Bureau of Land Management website. And I thought that was it. When I found that certificate and it was signed by um, the president at the time, McKinley. And I just, I thought that was it. Oh, look what I found. And it told me how much land he had and everything. And that was several years ago. And it wasn't until this year when Bernice started the Descendants of African-American Homesteaders that she helped me and, and guided me. And I now see that there's a land entry file on my great grandfather, which is 17 pages of information. Of course, I should have known there was a file someplace because the government loves to keep files on stuff. <laughs> and in this, these files, there are um, are testimonies. Initially, my great grandfather Samuel Brown listed four people who could be his witnesses that he lived on the land and he improved the land, but ended up only two people. Because only I think only two were needed, but you could provide more names. So two people acted as his witnesses. And they all attested to, he settled on 79.66 acres of land, but he cleared and farmed 15 acres. 
And he improved that land by building a, a home that was 16 by 20 feet, one crib for crops, a stable, and an outhouse. And he and, and my great grandmother raised a family of eight children on their property. It was in um, Westfield, a small town called Westfield that doesn't exist anymore in Simpson County, Mississippi. Unfortunately, um, Peter died. I mean, Peter, that's his, his son. That's how I found him. Um, Samuel died around maybe 1910 or so. And my great grandmother left. But in the back of my mind, I'm hearing that Nina Simone song about Mississippi. And I can't help but wonder what happened to my great grandfather. And did something happen so that somebody could take his land? You know, so that, that's something that um, I think I'm going to have to go to the Mississippi archives and research more about it. But the thing that brings me a lot of pride is that, you know, I always tell people Black history is American history and American history is, is Black history. And when we grew up, I mean, my dad watched all these cowboy movies. <laughs> Until he died at the age of 81, he watched cowboy movies. And how many Black cowboys did you see? Mm. How many Black farmers did you see? You know, you didn't see any. And, and we were led to believe that only white folk had land or went west or did homesteading or anything. So I'm very, very proud to be a part of this and have my great grandfather's story on the National Park website. And I am so grateful to Bernice. And Bernice, let me know when you want me to pull that Facebook page up. Sure. Uh huh. Yes. In fact, why don't you do it now? Okay. Because one of the things that I, was, I hope that I attempted to do was create a community of descendants of African-American homesteaders so that you could learn, so that you could gain as much information as possible to also discover your story. And so I do a lot of posting, but I've also encouraged the descendants to write their stories. And by doing that, I've given them a template of what they can do, how to write that story. And while they don't have to write it the way I laid it out, at least as a guy, you can do what you wanna do with it. But we have 98 members in the Descendants of African-American Homesteaders Facebook group. And whenever a descendant story comes out, it goes, they call it live. Once it's live, I announce it to everybody because I want people to know that yes, we do have African-American descendants of homesteaders. We probably have millions of folks and they just don't know it. Mm -hmm. So this is what the template looks like. You don't have to go, you can write between 500 and 1,000 words. You write what you feel in your heart is important. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is you're leaving a legacy because your story is now on this national uh, website. It's part of the Black Homesteading Project. And it gives you an opportunity to share where all of your family members and everybody else that you are a descendant of a homesteader. And so I, I'm just very happy that some of the descendants are on tonight because you can do what I did. I wrote my book. You can write your book. I know you have a book. You're ready to write, Denise. <laughs> but, May I please pull up an example of the show people sure, what it is looks like but Margo's just, story yes okay let me just click on that one right quick right and, and we would story like to the this, is, this is this is her ancestor he was a florida homesteader 
And as you can see, they put, I mean, if you have a photo, they'll put the photo. If you have some type of artifact, they'll put that up there. But when you go further down, the quick facts are the quick facts that you will put in into your story. And then after you've written your story, then there's a section where you, the descendant, will say a little bit about yourself. Okay. And this is what uh, Denise has done. This is with some of the other folks. Not only that, but they also will place the land entry papers on this site. These papers are being transcribed by volunteers. And if you click, just click the Bureau of Land Management detail, that'll take you to the land management site. And you'll see Margot Lee Williams' ancestor's name on that site. So we have several different ways. As here it is right here, Randall Farnell. Mm -hmm. So it takes you back. I mean, the, 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 what, what I want you all to, to understand is that you may find the land patent. Once you find the land patent, go to the Bureau of Land Management site get the document number and the application number. That opens the door for you to be able to obtain a copy of your land entry papers, which are available at the National Archives. And here's the document numbers here. Right, those are, and then if you uh, click uh, patent image, then the, the image will come right up and you'll see it. And this is the image that many of you have probably seen. And then there are related documents, which means they're going to show other individuals that may be associated or living near your ancestors' land. And mm -hmm. so you want to go and spend some time and just keep putting names. I think, Denise, you must have put several names in there. Uh, to be able to identify where uh, the different people you wanted to look for. I know I did the same thing. Once I saw those witnesses, I started checking to see well, who were the witnesses, were they also uh, landowners? Well, we do have a couple of questions that we would like to ask. Uh, and I know my co-host may have some too. Uh, Bernice, I was listening to you talk uh, when you spoke about they had to come up with their application fee. Correct. Give us a general amount of how much that would have been during that period in time. Oh my goodness, $18, I can't even, I, I need to have one of those <laughs> calculators. I don't even, I can't even imagine how much $18 was back in 1887. Uh, uh, it could have, for, for it could have been yeah. $100, $200, but, Think about well, that was a hard two hundred dollars. That was, that was yeah. a lot of money. Eighteen dollars yes, was a lot of money. Not only that, but they had to have farm tools. You can't clear land with just your bare hands. Mm -hmm. You had to have those farm tools. Uh, really, some heavy duty equipment to move those trees. You know, I'm looking at an ancestor in the piney woods. Well, somebody had to be there chopping down that wood to clear that land, so it could become farm land. Mm -hmm. So there's cer several things that they had to have. And some people really, they did abandon their claims. Mm -hmm. They abandoned them because they couldn't go forward. But what's exciting is that we do have people that were successful in wow. getting that land. And it's, it's, it's something to celebrate. It's something to share that legacy, to share it with all of your family members, because mm -hmm. it is something I didn't know about the Homestead Act. When I was growing up, did, did you, Antoinette? Did no. you, please, no. did you, Sandra? No. Uh, so we're finding this information, and it's not new information. It's been around. But mm -hmm. let's get these descendants of Black homesteaders to find their land and tell their story. Okay. And you um, your little pieces in there about your family that you know. Okay, Carrie, you have any questions? Is there any questions going from a chat room? Uh, so far, there are no questions from the chat room. And if you're in the chat room, if you have a question, please type it in and we'll make sure your question gets asked and, and answered. Uh, but uh, a question that I have 
is that, uh, well, I guess it's more of a comment, but, um, but I'll also throw a question in there. Uh, people couldn't realize that this is a, a way of finding additional documentation of your ancestors as you do your family history research. And so, uh, so my question is, um, do you have um, a sense of how many um, Black people across this country we could be looking at? Karen, I don't. And I'm going to tell you why. The act itself and even the applications, you don't see race in there. Oh. So you don't know. Oh. Yes, you do not know. So it's up to the descendants that have done their research and they discover the land patent that they then find out because the so rules it's are really, exactly it's the same. It is dependent upon us helping to uh, create that database and, and identify these people as uh, African-Americans. Uh, wow. That's correct. You're that was a great correct. question, Karen. Right. Great and question. Thank you for that. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because and we, we also have no want, idea. I also want to point out to everybody that the show will be up on YouTube tonight. And so anybody that's missing it and you want to share it, please go to Nurturing Our Roots um, uh, YouTube page and it will be up tonight. So please know that. And if there, Bernice, if anybody wants to get in contact with you to learn more about how to go about, is there an email address that you would like to put out well, there? What I would like to encourage individuals is to join the Descendants page. Okay. Because I put everything on that page. I'm constantly feeding it with information and telling people, read the Homestead Act, go to the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, I'll just keep putting information until I feel that everyone feels comfortable and confident that they know how to do that research. And then the next step is the request for the land entry papers. Antoinette, and Antoinette, I'm Antoinette Roos would like to congratulate you. Oh. Okay, um, we just wanna congratulate you, Bernice, on being the 2021 award-winning Indie Book Award. So once again, congratulations on the groundbreaking research and not just the research, but the documenting a part of the history that would not have been known if it had not been for you researching your own ancestor, Peter Clark. And so thank you for being that trailblazer once again. Well, thank you so much, Antoinette. And I owe, I owe something to my grandmother because my grandmother lived on that land and Peter Clark was her oh, wow. daddy. Yes, yes. <laughs> wow. Okay, Karen, back to you. Yeah, I was wondering, I guess uh, we need to see, um, I mean, we know that Emma bought her land, right? But was there, so maybe there's somebody else in our family that we don't know about. That well, had I, do, I do know that Robert and Alexander, they bought land in 1888 uh, in Tangerine Parish. Uh, but because we, we only know of two of his siblings, of uh, Alexander's siblings. So we just need to go to that uh, that site and just research their name to see if anything uh, would come up uh, that way. But I just know it was in 1888 and they purchased 200 acres of land for $200. And I think it was 50 cents an acre. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, Bernice, um, if we just put Harrell in there, uh, would any Harrells come up? Like, or, or do you have to put a first and last name in? You can just put a last name. You have to put a location and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe just test some stuff out. You test it yeah. out. I mean, you never know what's going to come up. Right. Uh, then you take it to the next level. Uh, certainly looking in the census and seeing that they are a farmer and an owner, that's a trigger right there that they could have been a homesteader. So allow that census to help you decide whether you're going to dig into the homestead land just by seeing how they are described in the census. Bernie, are you able to just browse through various names in a particular location? Or do absolutely. you have to a specific name? 
I would definitely tell you do community research. Mm-hmm. So that if you're looking in tangible whore, I would put tangible whore and I at least put one or two names that I know mm-hmm. and see what happens and then keep going after that because they're go- other names are going to come up. Oh, something else. And I went through Chronicling America. That's the Library of Congress site for newspapers. And I put in Louisiana, Homesteader, and I put a time period, I just some dates, and all the Homestead newspaper clippings popped up. So I saw, I saw a lot of names and a lot of people. But you got to think about this. You have to think of different ways that you're going mm-hmm. to search for, for your land. And something had to be put in the newspaper. So see what, what shows up. Denise, did you find anything? I know I put that in the Descendants page because I no. found some names in the newspaper. No, I didn't find it. I spent just a little bit of time, but I wanted to address another question. When you put like Louisiana, there are times where I will just put Louisiana, no county, only the last name, like Harold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It showed up in a mitt. It showed up in uh, Mississippi and it tells you the counties. So a lot of times when I couldn't find the name, the actual name like Dick Hunt, I just typed in Hunt, searched all of Mississippi, looked to the far right to see if there was Franklin or Wilkerson or Amit since those boundaries mm-hmm. changed a lot. So I did find a bunch of heralds there because like uh, Antoinette and I had talked before, our Great great grandfathers were probably brothers, but we are not sure yet. Mm-hmm. So um, when I found another Harold today, um, looking at through the witnesses, and that was his mother. So I just briefly looked, and um, a lot of Harold showed up. So I would have to go through um, all of Amit, Franklin, and Wilkinson County to uh, see if it was any of them. I also, for my Mississippi hunts, I looked in um, Louisiana and some of the other names and found their names there in Louisiana, okay. which I was really surprised. Did you find, did you find, did you find any in Louisiana or St. Helena? Yeah, it's in there. Mm-hmm. And um, because we know there's a, an emit on both sides of the, the line, emit Mississippi and emit Louisiana. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, if I, if I were you, I'd go back and check that again tonight. Okay. So, uh, but I was wondering, we still have to figure this one out. How is it that they lived in Mississippi all that time, but had a homestead in Baton Rouge, hmm. which another company got right after he died. So they applied for the final homestead. Nothing, Bernice and I are just finding out. I called mm-hmm. Mississippi and I said, well, I want to find out about this section that uh, I didn't tell them my great great grandmother owned it. I just said, I'm doing genealogy section 32, you know, Northeast, whatever. She said, well, give me a half hour and call me back. So I did. So she says, oh, that's owned by a warehouser timber company now. And I was like, really? So I went to warehouser and they start acquiring land in uh, Mississippi and Alabama in 1956. So we have a real mystery going here. Mm -hmm. And I saw where um, Peter Clark, uh, Bernice's great, great grandfather, Warehouser also owns his property. Right. So it will be be interesting to uncover it. Of course they haven't called me back yet, but that's okay. There's all kind of- The reality with all of you, you have speculators that are sitting in those courthouses and they're looking that land you have lumber companies because Mm -hmm. it's big industry Mm -hmm. and some of that land that our ancestors acquired back 200 years or 150 years ago Mm -hmm. now that land is owned by someone else Mm -hmm. bernice have you walked in that on the land that your ancestors i drove i drove in the area but i didn't walk on the land Yeah. But I noticed Shelly, Dr. Shelly Murphy and her mother have jars of soil 
that's from their land. And that's a that's a really good idea. And I think I'm gonna do that. I wanna go to the <laughs> You know, a couple of years ago, um, Karen and I, my grandfather and Karen's great grandfather, they are brothers. And Karen had never been to the Emma Mead Harrell homestead. And mm -hmm. I took her there. So it was two relatives that I took there who had never walked that land. And it's something, one of the relatives from California, when she came down, she just wanted to bring a rock back. You know, but <laughs> I like the idea uh, yeah. with, you know, some dirt or something like that, that would be a symbolic symbol of, you right. know, this is the land that our ancestors walked on. And yeah. I mean, it's just a, yeah. it's a beautiful spiritual journey to know that you're walking in the footsteps of your ancestors. Absolutely. Right. Right. Karen was so happy just to stand on mm -hmm. the land where her great grandfather was raised and all his life until moving to New Orleans. Yeah. Oh. It, was, it was wonderful to, uh, to see the land. And, and even for my relatives in um, Assumption Parish, I don't know where exactly they live, but just driving through there, mm -hmm. it just, you know, it just gives you a certain kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And so we would definitely like to encourage anyone that's, that's watching uh, the, her Facebook page. And once again, you can just post your questions. And I see that the membership is growing. It's 98 members. It is a private page. And so they would have to grant permission from you to join the page. Is that correct? Yes, and they are asked questions, you know. Yes. Do you have a land patent? Do you have your land entry papers? Just some information that I could get an idea of who's coming into the page. Uh -huh. um, and I also want to make certain that people are not joining the page and they're thinking homesteading means something else. Yes. And we're focusing on that Homestead Act of 1862. I make that really clear. That's what we're looking at. People that acquired land under that act. That's amazing. Anybody else would like to make a comment? Uh, we haven't heard from, I think we heard from Sandra. Sandra, whenever you come down to look to Mississippi, especially Simpson County, I would like to join you on that particular trip that you make. Good. I'm, I'm looking forward to um, not, yeah, probably early next year or so. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, uh, anyone else want to say something? Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi, everybody. This is Fallon. How are you? Hi, Fallon. Mm -hmm. Hi I am. Um, I am traveling, but I did want to mention uh, for the panel, I want to say thank you, Bernice, a special thank you to you. I am a person who was a Facebook um, follower. <laughs> And I was able to follow the prompts that you all have mentioned. And it led to me finding uh, my ancestor who owned land in Florida. And uh, the, I'm a genealogist, so I work uh, with my family's history, but specifically my grandmother who is living and 91 years old requested that I find her family. Oh, wow. And I, yes, yes. And I had it, um, I, I looked into some of it I always thought, okay, I'm not going to find anybody. Uh, I did find her great grandmother um, who was enslaved, Millie Bell. Uh, but after finding Bernice's post and also her group, I decided to take that look a little further and look up their surname. And it was a blessing because we were able to find her ancestor, Simon Bell, and not only uh, did he own land and was he a homesteader, but I also found her mother and her grandmother living on that land with him. And so I was able to share that with my living grandmother um, who recently DNA tested as well. And so she's found an interest and um, her comment is she wishes her mother was here to see it. Oh. So Yes. And I, I want, before you go, I just wanted to share that with you. I was a person who recently just literally saw Bernice's post on Facebook and followed her prompts, um, went to do the research and I found my ancestor. So it's given me a new way to look at all of the members in my tree um, and also a new way to speak to others who want to learn about their ancestry so they can learn the bigger picture. And I, I also wanted to speak to the point 
of whether you would know if you're if the um, applicant was black or white. Uh, Bernice pointed this out to me, which I probably wouldn't have known it, um, that it was uncommon. But Simon wrote on his application that he was a native born citizen of the United States by virtue of emancipation proclamation by President Lincoln. And so we had this discussion because I said, well, well, I really want to talk about that. What do you think about that? And it was basically Bernice explained it to me like he he put on paper that he was enslaved and he's free. He is a free man and he's purchasing his land. And I grew up thinking my family didn't have any land. I don't have any ties to, you know, any property. What's my family history in terms of land development? Um, and now I know that we own land and not only that, but he's farmland and I am actually in agriculture myself. So there's a lot of ties. I mean, this is, it's a beautiful opportunity to not only learn about your past, but also find out why you're here now and help others as well. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for this. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this op space to learn and allowing me to speak. So you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. And thank you, Fallon, for just sharing this because I think Fallon just joined the group last week. Wow. <laughs> and that information, yes. was, I, mean, I mean, she just joined it and she found the, the land patent and land entry papers and everything. So, you know, I don't want to make everybody think it's instant, but truly, John uh, Page. <laughs> And, you know, I, I just want to say this, although we haven't found any land patents in our family, but um, we're trying to hold on to the last 20 acres of land in our family. And um, Karen can contest to this, attest to this, that I get very emotional behind that land because I lived on the land. Mm -hmm. um, and, and across the land is divided on both sides of the road. And when I was a little girl, I had no idea that I knew that house was my great grandmother's, but I had no idea that my ancestor, Robert Harrell, who was a slave, who was a former slave, lived in that house. And so there was multi-generations that walked that land and formed that land. And so uh, that land has a piece of my heart, you know, because I, I know what it is to to walk on the land that your ancestor taught so, I mean, just so hard to keep it. And that whether it was a dollar or $2, that was a hard dollar or $2. They had to work hard to get the money to just pay the note or keep the land. And so in 18, in 1900, African-Americans owned over, um, I think it was, 15.5 million acres of land. And today we're down to less than 1.2 million acres of land. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Bernice, for raising the awareness of how important it is. That's the one thing that our ancestors wanted when they became free, land. Absolutely. They wanted land. Mm -hmm. They worked collectively as a family uh, as a community, because they helped each other. Like you were saying before, Bernice, when they had to clear that land, the neighbors came together, the men in the community came together. And when you talked about the size of the house, it didn't matter. They was free because they had their own land. They was working their land. They was building their house. And so that was a prideful moment that we all should take pride. And when my grandmother, Emma, purchased that land, women didn't even have the right to purchase land. And so I did trace how this woman was able to move around as much as she did with doing the things that she did in a time when women didn't even have rights to do things that she did. Any, any comments, Karen, coming off the chat? Uh, yeah, well, just some comments, not questions. Uh, Scott, number one, says, my family had land in Texas, but it was taken and they turned it into a lake. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and, and that's sad because we do know that uh, throughout history, um, you know, they have found ways to take land from our families. And that's why it's so important to take care of the land that is currently in your family. 
In fact, my husband and I were talking about some of the land his family has in Mississippi. And I said, well, you know, land is definitely one way of building generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have much money, you can live on your land. You could grow your garden. You, you won't be hungry. Even if you have to pitch a tent on that land, it's, it's your land, you know, so. You know, just something that really concerns me is that a lot of the younger people, first of all, they don't even know the legal description of the land, where it's located, whose name the land is in. You know, uh, and I just find that we have to do better at family reunions and family gatherings to make sure that these topics are uh, at, the, at the dining room table, you know, uh, just to mention the land or talk about it and, and sometime take a field trip and let the young people go there and walk on that land, at least know that person's name, you know, that's very important to me. You know, we have to teach people. I know even as an adult, um, I didn't know that uh, there was such a thing as a legal description until I bought a house. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, if we are not teaching our young people, uh, you know, raising them with the, um, the understanding of um, what it takes to be a homeowner, a landowner, uh, they won't know uh, such things. They just remember riding in the car to the country somewhere, yeah. not really even realizing what little town they were in mm -hmm. because we didn't teach them. Right, right. And so uh, once again, Bernice, thank you for the labor of love. Um, you have really shown so many of us um, that it's possible to go back and to learn from those records and that those records are available. So we thank you and we thank and, and giving homage to your ancestor, P, uh, Peter Clark from leading you, your mother. Cause I remember when, you know, you, you, you would tell me the story about your mom, you know, you all would drive there. So uh, there was a lesson and thank you for sharing. And you shared so much knowledge. And before we close out, please tell us about your show and when it comes on and so that we can get that out there as well. Right. Well, I have a blog talk radio show. It's called Research at the National Archives and Beyond Blog Talk Radio every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can listen to it as a podcast or you can listen to it live. But regardless, whenever it is on, enjoy. It's no longer than 30 to 40 minutes long. And no commercials, straight talk. And we're talking about a little bit of everything. Yes, you have many different guests from in many different areas and many different subjects that you talk about as it relates to genealogy and history. That's correct. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Denise, what are you working on these days? <laughs> Almost too many things. I'm finishing <laughs> up... Um, the yeah. genealogy book for children. I just got to upload it. I mean, I write about um, theology, diversity, and uh, genealogy for children as well as for young adults. Yes, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we just want to thank everybody for being a guest on Nurturing Our Rules from Slavery to Freedom. And uh, like Bernice, we talk about many different subjects on this particular show. And genealogy is the tool that helps you to learn so much about history, American mm -hmm. history. America, right. you know, our history is the fabric of America's history. And so in honoring our ancestors, especially as we approach Juneteenth, we lift up their names, we call their names because it is so important. If it wasn't for them, it would not be us. And we must right. always, always remember to honor them, to honor the legacy and their mm -hmm. memories and pass it on because one day we will be one of those ancestors, you know, whether we right. want to face the right. music or not. And so um, anytime we have that opportunity to always reach out to the younger people because that's very important is to pass this knowledge on to the next generation, you know. I know a lot of times uh, many of us can uh, uh, attest to this that 
we wasn't allowed to sit around the grown folks back in that time right. when they're talking, but we can do something a little bit different now is to right. share information and take the, take the young people to the courthouse, take them to the cemetery, take them to the land. You know, it's just different things that we can do uh, now that we are kind of opening up since COVID to get our younger people involved uh, uh, with genealogy research. Karen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, uh, before I even go there, I just wanted to also give Bernice one more last chance to tell us the name of the Facebook group. It's the Descendants of African American Homesteaders. Okay, all righty. Um, are you going to play the video, Antoinette? Yes, yes, okay. yes. You know I have to do that. All right, before, before you do that, I just want to thank everybody in the chat room. And if you want to continue the conversation, uh, just do that in the comments. Go ahead, Antoinette. Hit that button. Should I do that, Karen? Hit that button. Thank you for joining us on Nurturing Our Roots. Please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our videos. Thank you. And I just want to say congratulations. Thank you for Bernice. joining us on Nurturing oh, Our Roots. Please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our videos. All right, good for that. And I just want to say once again, congratulations, Bernice. And I do know when they do the ceremony in June, you will let us know so that we can all tune in. Thank you. Yes, so I will let you know. <laughs> well, thank you. And we would like to thank everyone for joining us here tonight on Nurturing Our Roots from Slavery to Freedom every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. Thank you all for being a guest and thank all of you that was in the chat room listening. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.